starting pretty much on time tonight. I call that a win. Um, you know what? We're going to dive right in because I think we might have more than an hour's worth of discussion ahead of us. So uh, let's get started. And as other people uh, sign on, they can join us. Miss Pam, I cannot see your presentation. All right. Um, we're going to jump right in with um, a look at last week's topic, which was witch hazel. And I know we've talked about witch hazel a couple of times over the course of um, our last few meetings. Uh, we looked at the, uh, the awesome uh, seed cases that this plant forms. It actually takes a whole year. Uh, it's one of the few plants that will have um, a seed case ready to open along with flowers that are waiting to be pollinated. So that's one of Witch Hazel's um, many uh, really remarkable qualities. But I, I wanted to kind of clarify something. Uh, in the column, uh, if you had a chance to read it, you might have noted, uh, and if you didn't have a chance to read it, I'll tell you, um, I talked a little bit about um, the pollinators for this plant. Um, and one of them, uh, one that I called out in particular, and I kind of, the way I wrote it, it kind of made it sound as though this was the pollinator for this plant, and it's actually not. There are, as it turns out, several different insects that are equipped to pollinate uh, witch hazel, and we're talking about Virginiana, the, uh, the fall blooming witch hazel that starts blooming eh, around here. Um, late October or November, and it has a pretty long bloom time. In fact, um, I checked the witch hazel that's in the native plant garden at Potawatomi um, when I was there last week, and I noticed uh, that those blooms are still growing strong. The um, witch hazel that's in my neighborhood still has blooms that are going strong. Um, I actually, I walked over to one of the witch hazels last night just to see if I could see any pollinating action uh, at night, and I couldn't. I walked over in the daytime and looked again, and I didn't see anything, but it was just a matter of timing. I'm sure if I'd had, you know, a few weeks to camp out in front of the witch hazel, I would have seen something going on because all the witch hazels that I've looked at around here have had uh, seed cases, uh, some of which have opened. Um, and when you've got seeds, that's a sure sign that you've got pollinators. But uh, there is this group of um, uh, outlet moths that has um, the ability to shiver and uh, warm themselves. They, they get a, a thoracic temperature that is, is quite warm up in the, uh, I want to say the 80s or the 90s uh, uh, degrees Fahrenheit, which is, is quite a, a remarkable feat for an insect that um, isn't what we would consider uh, warm-blooded. Um, and the, uh, the famous naturalist Bernd Heinrich had called out these moths as a, a very likely pollinator of witch hazel. Now this is an article, it goes all the way back to 2012. It was from the Michigan um, Entomological Society. Um, and hey, Pam? Yes, uh-huh. Are you sharing your screen because I cannot see anything? Oh, Silvana, you're the one that keeps me on my toes. Um, I thought I was, but you know what? I might not have clicked on it. I can see great. <laughs> I can see you great. You look fantastic. <laughs> wow, wow. How do you like my hair tonight? Lovely. <laughs> Let me try this again. I got in such a hurry. All right, let's hit. All right. Now is it looking like it's starting to share? Not yet. Uh, no. How about now? Yes. All right. We'll oh, from where we left off. How's that? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So we're looking uh, at a newsletter that's produced by the, the bug folks up in Michigan. And this is for some photos that were uh, captured by one of their uh, one of their members of a, uh, a outlet moth. Uh, this was um, taken in October up in Michigan. Uh, clearly some, some pollinating activity going on. But um, you know, I did a little bit deeper dive into the pollinators of um, witch hazel. And it turns out there's a whole bunch. Um, there was a, a piece of uh, research um, 
that noted that the flower emits a faint odor that's a little sweet and a little putrid. And boy, if that doesn't call out, um, uh, you know, nature perfume, I don't know what does, a little sweet, a little putrid. Um, it has um, nectar that has quite a bit of sugar in it, something that would be attractive to uh, bees as well as flies. Um, and it also produces a lot of pollen that's very sticky. So uh, again, this is a plant that's blooming at a time of year when there aren't as many insects flying. So it's important that that pollen, once it reaches um, a pollinator, that, it, does, that it, it attaches itself and it can make its, its way to another flower uh, on the witch hazel plant so that uh, pollination can be achieved. Well, um, these uh, researchers, Anderson and Hill in 2002, collected 298 different insects. Of those, the vast majority actually were flies. And of those flies, many of those were these little guys here. Um, the, uh, there's, there's a lot of different fungus gnats, but these dark, dark winged fungus gnats, there's actually even many, many species of those. Uh, but 42% of uh, the, the uh, insects on the witch hazel flowers, and this is in uh, Connecticut, by the way, were these fungus gnats. Um, of those other flies, 23 other fly families were represented, which um, there in itself, I think maybe the, the putrid smell might be an attraction there. Um, and then uh, there were 53 individual wasps and bees uh, representing 18 different families. So maybe they were going after the, the sweet part of the scent. Uh, eight beetles from seven different families. Um, and then here's where it gets kind of interesting. Uh, minute pirate bugs, assassin bugs, um, the lacewing. These bugs here, um, pirate bugs, assassin bugs, lacewings, these are present. And they, uh, a lot of times, will feed on aphids. Now, these researchers found that there were two aphids and one thrips. Thrips are tiny uh, little um, primitive insects. I don't even think they fly. But um, I thought the, uh, the predatory insects that were present on this witch hazel were interesting um, because it turns out there is yet another chapter to the witch hazel story. Um, now, when I first started looking at the, the blossoms this fall and looking at the seed cases, remember I, I picked that one, um, that one little pot and I brought it home and it, it exploded and it sent its two seeds flying. I only found one of them. I think my cat ate the other one. But um, there was another structure that I was looking at when I was looking at witch hazel. And it's this one here on the right. So on the left, um, we have what the seed case looks like. Um, and on the right, uh, we have this, this pokey looking thing. And I, I wasn't sure exactly what that was. Um, so I, I did a little bit of digging around uh, for things that grow on witch hazel. And lo and behold, there is an aphid that uh, hangs out uh, on witch hazel. It's one of um, a lot of aphids will spend time um, on more than one type of plant. They'll have a life cycle that actually involves at least two different species in order to be completed. And in witch hazel's case, um, this, is, this is called the spiny witch hazel gall. Um, and it involves an aphid that um, uh, you can see is named uh, Hemolystes spinosus. Um, it's got this first, the uh, genus name uh, stands for witch hazel and spinosis stands for the spiny nature of the gall that it forms. And look at this crazy life cycle. I had to make sure I put bullet points in so that I would remember all the steps. But um, these aphids, um, uh, they lay eggs on witch hazel in the summertime, in June and July. Um, those eggs uh, don't really do a whole lot. They overwinter on the plant and they hatch the following spring. Uh, those nymph, uh, nymphal aphids um, then feed on the flower buds. They mature, they mate, they lay eggs. As that's all happening, all of that activity induces the witch hazel to form that spiny gall. 
and these these aphids develop inside it. A lot of times ants show up about this time too because you know, aphids, let, when they feed, um, they excrete a sweet substance uh, called, generically it's called honeydew. So uh, sometimes you'll see some, some ants that are actually tending some of these aphids on the witch hazel. Um, so um, inside that spiny gall, this next generation of aphids forms and they have wings. So then they fly uh, over to a birch tree and, and typically it's a, a river birch tree. So we need, um, in this area, we need the uh, fall blooming witch hazel and then we need a river birch nearby. Uh, for this aphid to complete its um, full two-year life cycle. So, so those aphids will fly uh, from the witch hazel to the birch tree. And then on the birch tree, um, here's a photo here from the extension service. Uh, they lay, um, uh, they, they create, uh, they lay eggs and they create another generation that is a, kind of a scabby scale. See these white um, uh, little dots here? Those are the scaly form of the aphid. Um, and then they induce yet another gall to form on the leaves of the river birch. Sometimes you'll see river birch leaves that look, I always wondered, you know, what was causing that. They, they look, um, uh, well, like they've got something going on. And as it turns out, it's these, these witch hazel aphids. Um, so then that scale light generation um, lasts through uh, till the next winter where they, they hibernate on the birch and then they produce a wing generation that flies back to the witch hazel and they start it all over again. So um, if we go back for a second here, these spiny galls, they're actually the production, uh, the result of a two year life cycle as well. So um, all kinds of cool things to look for on witch hazel and they are still blooming. Like I said, I've, I've in fact, just last night I went over and looked at the one that's in my neighborhood and um, I was shooting pictures in the dark hoping that uh, what my poor eyes couldn't catch at night, maybe the camera would, but, uh, and I also went and looked around some, some lights that were in the area to see if there were any insects that were flying last night. We were in a, a kind of an unusually warm period for this time of December, uh, but um, at least last night, my little snapshot of uh, life of the witch hazel did not reveal uh, any activity. But if you uh, happen upon one, and, and we do have them in the native plant garden at Potawatomi, and they occur here and there throughout um, the forest preserves and natural areas um, here in Kane County, uh, see if you can find uh, not only the, the yellow flowers and not only the, uh, the seed cases, which by the way, uh, produce two seeds each, um, but also see if you can find some of these um, spiny witch hazel galls too. The cool little side story for what's going on on witch hazel this time of year. Now this, this uh, two uh, species life cycle for aphids, it's, it's not really that unusual. Um, I remember uh, a few years ago, Joan Kramer, who is the gardener who tends the native plant garden at Potawatomi, she came in with this handful of these fuzzy looking galls, uh, I'm sorry, aphids, um, and they were on the alder trees that are planted along the river um, in the native plant garden. It turns out that um, that's a type of woolly aphid that um, travels between alders and silver maples, and they go back and forth. Uh, there's also another type of woolly aphid in Illinois, that's the apple uh, elm aphid. It can be on an apple, or a hawthorn or a rose bush, anything in that family, but then it needs an elm tree to complete its life cycle. So it's just kind of a, yet another example of how um, bizarre things that you wouldn't think are connected actually have very deep and vital connections. Uh, this fall, I had gotten uh, this picture from a reader who said, what the heck is going on with my cedar tree? Well, this is, uh, this is actually not an aphid, caused structure. Um, this is caused by a fungus. It's called cedar apple rust. Uh, and again, cedar in this area actually means juniper. Sometimes you'll see it called juniper apple rust. Um, and the, the spores of this fungus need um, an apple or a hawthorn tree nearby in order to complete its life cycle. Now, this is when the fungus is um, pretty much 
finished growing and it's producing spores, when it first develops, um, it looks kind of like this. Um, and sometimes uh, when it's not starting to send out these, these spore producing organs, you'll just see a big knob on the end of a juniper bush. Now I, I looked at it, um, this uh, fruiting body here, um, and then I looked at this picture, which shows it you know, on its way, and I thought, boy, that, that reminds me of something. And the, the first thing I thought of was a kid from the Rugrats. I can't remember which, what his name is, um, but um, I watched a fair amount of Rugrats in the 90s, and um, this structure kind of reminded me of uh, that cartoon. And then I looked at it again, and you know what, there's something else, and I thought, oh, this is so timely, I'll throw it in there. It kind of also looks like a coronavirus. So um, next time you see something funky going on in a juniper uh, tree in this area, uh, look around, you'll probably find a crab apple or an apple tree, maybe a hawthorn tree nearby, uh, and you're looking at cedar apple rust. Um, so with that, I've got a question, and you can you can respond in the in the uh, the chat if you'd like, um, or we can talk about it later on. Um, I got an email the other day from a gentleman who was wondering what the heck is going on with brown marmorated stink bugs. Um, a few years ago, my porch screen was covered with stink bugs, but last year there were hardly any, and this fall I've only seen four or five. What's happened to them? Did they go away? Has a predator taken a liking to them? Or have I just been lucky the last few years, and I will see them again soon? Um, well, this got me curious, and I've been, I may have asked some of you, you know, have you seen any stink bugs this year? Um, I actually also put the question out on uh, Facebook. Um, if you're at all interested in bugs and you're on Facebook, check out Insects and Spiders of Illinois. Um, there's, uh, there's some just, you know, general insect fanciers on there, but then there's also um, people who are, uh, there's quite a few entomologists that follow that group as well. So if you've got a question, um, put it out there and see. I, I put this question out earlier today. Um, uh, and it looks like there's 86 comments so far. I said, um, usually this time of year, uh, we hear from lots of people saying their houses have been invaded with brown marmorated stink bugs. But this year, nothing but crickets is in silence. How about you? Are you finding uh, brown marmorated stink bugs? Please include your county in your response. Well, you know, Northern Illinois um, is, seems to, uh, they, there don't seem to be very many around here. Now, uh, a woman out in Peoria said that she's got them everywhere. Um, this is one of these questions that I don't really have an answer to, and it's, it's kind of something that's going to need some trends to develop over time. Did we have something weather-wise this year that resulted in a reduction in their numbers? We, we had that really wet spring. We had a really dry, uh, when was that, July into August. Did that somehow affect their development? Um, this gentleman, Kevin, suggested maybe there's a predator that's taken a liking to them. Um, well, you know, stink bugs, uh, my, my cat loves to play with them. Um, but I, they do have that that chemical that is their defense. So there's um, a lot of birds, which are big bug eaters. They don't typically uh, like to eat stink bugs. Um, well, just coincidentally, this week I got an email um, from a woman in Darien who possibly had a solution. Now, um, before we go to that, I want to show you uh, this character on the left here. This is who we're talking about. The Marmorated stink bug. This is the invader. It, it was first um, noticed, oh, I don't know, about 15 years ago or so out in uh, around Allentown, Pennsylvania. The, the thinking was that they had been there for a while, but they were first identified, uh, I think it was in 2002. Um, and they're the kind of bug that, that has been able to cover a lot of ground very quickly. One, they, they fly, I mean, and that always aids. Um, and insects distribution. Remember when um, uh, the emerald ash borer first showed up in Michigan? My, uh, sorry about that. The um, the rings of how it expanded year after year um, 
it grew quickly, the, uh, the territory that it was covering grew quickly because of it being able to fly. Well, um, brown marmorated stink bugs also fly, but they also, because of the way they, they um, gather in, to overwinter, now in um, parts of Asia, China and Japan, places where they're native to, their instinct is to head um, for crevices in, in cliffs and rocks. Well, around here, they head for crevices in houses and in um, uh, trailers and mobile homes, RVs, things like that. Um, people would uh, have a vehicle parked outside of their house for the winter, and then they would drive to their summer home, and they would move a bunch of stink bugs with them. Uh, so, so anyway, this bug has, has skipped its way uh, west fairly quickly. I did want to point out, though, before we get to, to Kathy's email, um, we do have native stink bugs, too. And check out the, um, the similarities, for one. Um, both insects have these um, uh, kind of bands here at the back of the abdomen. They both have a similar kind of a rounded shoulder here, up here by the thorax. But on the antennae, uh, uh, the brown marmorated stink bug will have bands on the antenna. And the native brown stink bug does not. So um, if you're looking to, to save the natives and, and um, not save the non-natives, that's your ID characteristic. There's some other tiny little things that um, we won't get into, but that's that's the main thing, and it's really obvious too. See, these these bands are the giveaway. So, this is the invader. This is the native, and this is what Kathy Street had to say. Now, Kathy is a member of the Darien Dirt Diggers Garden Club, and uh, she was finding this wasp in her yard uh, this past summer. Um, the four-banded stink bug hunter wasp. Um, now, it doesn't capture the adults, but it, um, just as we've talked about so many times over the past few months, it's, it's a solitary wasp and it, it specializes in capturing, um, uh, in this case, stink bugs um, to feed its young. Other solitary wasps, we talked about the cicada killers, remember that they specialize in killing cicadas. Um, well, these wasps are um, specialists in stink bug nests. Um, they uh, provision their nests, which they make in the ground, and they will uh, sting the nymph to paralyze it. Uh, remember, paralyzing, they don't want to kill it, because if they killed it, then it would start to rot, and then their offspring wouldn't have um, a very good meal waiting for them. So they, they paralyze these nymphs, they stuff them down the holes, and then their um, developing larvae will have uh, fresh food to feed on. So I, I don't know that this particular wasp is why we don't have stink bugs this year. It's probably a, a factor of, you know, there's probably a lot of different things going on, but I'm wondering, uh, there's a few other solitary wasps that will also go after true bugs, uh, including stink bugs. So uh, I'm just wondering if maybe we're starting to see a shift uh, and that some of our natives are, are stepping up and taking uh, care of some of uh, our introduced species. We'll have to keep an eye on it, but um, again, I, ca I can't really uh, access the chat while I'm doing the screen share, but if you've seen stink bugs in your house, if you've got a lot of them, definitely um, let us know. If you haven't seen any, that's interesting as well. But uh, yeah, 86 responses. Uh, check it out on um, Insects and Spiders of Illinois on Facebook. Um, in interesting responses that we're seeing from people there. And um, over at Casa Auto, I saw one in my house. It was back in September. Uh, people always ask me, you know, when they've got a lot of stink bugs, what do they do with them? I'm probably not the best source for answers for there because what I do at my house is I just leave them. Uh, indoor, not so much the temperatures that are a problem. They, they actually do quite well in our um, indoor, you know, 68 to 72 degree winter indoor temperatures. But what kills these bugs is the lack of humidity. Um, if I let one hang out long enough, and again, Jimmy Cat doesn't step up and, and uh, grab him, um, they usually end up heading for uh, the sponge by the kitchen sink or uh, the, um, the tub 
somewhere where there will be uh, some water that they can get a drink. They, if you just leave them be, chances are they're going to dry out and die from lack of humidity. Now, if you've got a lot, it's probably not a viable solution, but um, anyway, that's what I do at my house with the few that I've seen over the years. Um, with that, I'm gonna put out another question to you. This is something that I just kind of assumed I had an answer to, but now the more I think about it, the more I'm not so sure. I'm wondering how many of you have seen something like this. This is a, a, a bear tree in uh, late fall and stuck in the middle is a black walnut. So what's going on? Um, this year in particular, I've been seeing them all over. This in one walk to work, I saw these two. I have one on the uh, propane tank of my gas grill and I have one on the windowsill um, uh, that my laundry room looks out on. Um, I, not, I thought I, that I knew what was going on. I thought um, that in rounding up the usual suspects that we would be looking at this guy, Professor Nutso, also known as the squirrel. Um, they are, um, with their strong jaws and their sharp teeth, they do a bang up job. They're not the, the only mammals that eat nuts, uh, walnuts in particular, black walnuts, but they eat more than probably any of the other mammals we have in this area. Um, and used this picture a few weeks ago when we were talking about uh, the, uh, the walnut stains that uh, squirrels get in the fall when they are eating, uh, they're chewing that husk off of the black walnut. Um, so this is this has always been my number one suspect. Um, but some of these, uh, if we go back to um, these pictures here, like these small shrubs, um, they're not really something you see squirrels climbing around in. Um, so I started thinking some more, and I thought. I wonder if crows stash walnuts in shrubs. They could. Um, I don't know though, I have a hard time picturing a crow landing on my deck and putting a nut on the propane tank of my gas grill. Um, I suppose it could happen. And especially when that one showed up on the, uh, the windowsill by the laundry room. Uh, I'm not really sure that a crow would do that, but I certainly have a lot of blue jays in the neighborhood and they know they like to eat nuts. Now, can a blue jay pick up a black walnut with its bill and carry it? I don't know. Um, a few years back, I found several butternuts. Um, now, the butternut is the, the fruit of the white walnut tree. Um, butternuts, um, we don't have a lot of butternuts in our area. They're prone to uh, a disease that's been killing them off. Uh, we, I'm trying to think of where there's a butternut um, that you could go and look at. They, they're just, they don't survive long around here. Uh, there is one in my neighborhood. Um, it was, it's two blocks away and I always thought it was strange that a squirrel would carry a butternut two blocks to stash by my house. But a bird could certainly carry a nut uh, greater distances like that. Um, I wish I could say, aha, here's the solution. I don't have one, but I would love again for you to chime in uh, in the chat and see um, who you vote for. Maybe there's a fourth suspect I haven't thought of, but um, squirrels, crows, Blue jays, those were the three species that came to my mind. I was considering woodpeckers, but other than the pileated woodpecker, I don't think um, there's a woodpecker around here that's big enough to carry a black walnut. And I certainly didn't have a pileated woodpecker in my backyard um, in front of my laundry room window. So I ruled them out. But anyway, think about it, mull it over. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. It's something that's been kind of bothering me, especially this past week when I've been seeing these nuts stashed in so many different places. Now with that, um, so Kathy Street, um, 
from the Darien uh, Garden Club in her email, she also, she referred to um, this picture that she had sent into their Garden Club newsletter. And I thought it was the coolest thing. I've never seen this before either. Um, the Wasp Water Tower. Um, this is a bald-faced hornet's nest in its very early stages. And they, they don't do this all the time. Um, I've never been lucky enough to see one like this. I did see one small, it was maybe baseball size, um, bald-faced hornet nest several years ago, but um, it didn't have this tube on it. And so uh, Kathy and I were kind of musing back and forth as to why they would do this. And, and not every hornet does this. Not every hornet queen will do this when she builds her nest. But uh, a couple theories we have. One, um, in earlier uh, springtime, when it's still kind of cold out, having a, an extension tube like this might protect the uh, developing larvae inside from cold drafts. Um, it's the, the wind blows by. Um, it might also make the nest easier to defend rather than being able to um, approach the nest from all around. There's really just this one entrance. Now, um, as the nest gets larger, that material gets recycled. Um, the workers will um, chew it up and, and redistribute it in the nest. You know, they get to be football size, volleyball size, basketball size. So that two will eventually go away um, and it will leave one opening uh, that usually has a couple of uh, guard wasps uh, parked by it but uh, when there's a, a tube like this it might uh, make uh, approaching predators easier to spot and easier to kick out. Um, Kathy also had <laughs> another name for bald face hornet that I'd never heard before the white ass hornet so um, Think about that too the next time you see these guys, which will probably be next spring. But, but keep your eyes open for this. I would love to hear if any of you are able to spot a, uh, a young nest uh, that's forming and if it has this, this tube and makes this cool water tower shape. Um, I've got a little uh, commercial. Um, Terry Meesley uh, was in our King County Certified Naturalist class. He's actually, uh, I believe he's a chemical engineer um, by. Uh, trade, but he is a bug guy, and in, uh, specifically, he is a native bee guy. Um, Terry is uh, conducting a webinar tomorrow for uh, the Conservation Foundation. Uh, their website is theconservationfoundation.org, and if you go to their events page, you can sign up for this free Zoomcast tomorrow from 1 to 2.30. Um, Terry, he emailed me this morning asking if I could get the word out. He said he's, he's, um, he was still working uh, on the presentation at that time, but he, he promised that it would be good. Terry uh, conducted a class for us uh, in August on native, uh, native bees. Um, he also knows quite a bit about um, you know, wasps as well and the interactions uh, between bees and wasps. Um, he was the one that told me about how you can look inside the bloom of a morning glory flower. If you get out before say nine or 10 o'clock in the morning uh, before the, the bees have started to warm up and fly and start their day, a lot of times you'll find a, uh, a native bee curled up and sleeping inside of a morning glory blossom. Uh, so that was kind of a cool tip from Terry. I'm sure he'll have lots more, but if you're available uh, tomorrow at one o'clock, check out his presentation. I'm sure he's got a lot of cool things to say. And moving right along, we've got quite a few things I wanted to show you tonight. Um, some of you had been saying, oh, you know, I've got these nature nerd friends um, and or, or I've, I'm making my list for my non-nature nerd friends and uh, I want to give them some suggestions. So um, we're going to present for the first time ever the Good Natured Holiday Gift Giving Guide. Um, I got to thank... Um, Bill and Kathy Swedberg for this tip. Remember the last few weeks we've been um, shining a black light on um, different things, usually things that are active at night. It started with flying squirrels uh, a few weeks ago. Well, actually it started with that article that was making the rounds on the internet about uh, how someone discovered that the platypus uh, fluoresces under black light. Well, um, 
in 2019, it was discovered that flying squirrels fluoresce as well. It's a brilliant hot pink color. Um, uh, and the, the reason behind that is, is not well understood yet. Uh, last week, we looked at, at all the cool colors that appear on an opossum when you hit it with a black light. Well, um, science and surplus, uh, which is kind of a mecca for nature nerds, uh, that lots of different kinds of nerds like to shop at science and surplus. This is over on Route 38 in Geneva. Um, they have uh, three different types of black lights. Uh, so if you're looking to shop local for your favorite nature nerd, you can uh, check out their selection. You can actually um, order these online and do curbside pickup there, which is a nice feature that they've been offering uh, now that we're in our whatever tier we are of mitigations, thanks to COVID. But um, uh, black lights there. And um, the of these three, this one on the right is the one at mine that I've been using uh, also has 41 UV LEDs, but mine does not have this feature where you can switch um, between modes. This one you can switch from 21 to 41, depending on the intensity of the light that you want to shine. Um, but uh, some cool selections there, and Bill and Kathy appreciate that tip very much. Um, when I was looking or thinking about science and surplus, uh, I remember that this would be another great gift if you don't have a loop yet. I highly recommend you get one. Uh, and, and loops or uh, magnifying glasses, uh, they come in lots of different um, sizes and shapes, but this particular style um, is handy because you can put it on a string and wear it around your neck. Um, the, the 10 times magnification is the one that's most commonly used by botanists. And a lot of times it's uh, a plant part that you're looking at with these. These are also though, they're handy for insects as well. Uh, you can see Science and Surplus has a, a pretty wide range uh, in quality. Um, this one right here in the middle is probably their top of the line. Um, and it probably works the best. I, I could tell you, some of you have been in KCCN uh, in years when we've given out loops. Um, we've gone uh, with the, due to budgetary constraints, the super loop. Uh, these don't work bad, but it, um, uh, this uh, LED light doesn't last a real long time. Um, the light can be handy, but generally speaking, you can use a loop without um, having it have a light on it. Um, but you, you hold this up uh, to your eye and then you adjust the distance of the object that you're looking at until it comes into focus. And uh, I tell you, a world will be revealed to you. I've been using my loop at home. Remember uh, Dining Room Spider? I've been watching her um, protect. She's still guarding her egg case. Um, I still look at her every morning when I'm eating breakfast. And um, I'm using the loop to see if I can see inside of the egg case. There doesn't seem to be any activity yet um, inside uh, the egg sac. Um, she's still guarding it. She's still feeding, which I thought was a real good sign. Some spiders, after they lay uh, their eggs for the season, they're done and they're gone. But uh, she, being a grass spider, I think has a, a slightly different approach to things. She may even kick out another egg case before she's done. I don't know. But anyway, a loop is a fantastic gift. Um, uh, you can even buy, uh, for all your friends and family, you can buy them in packages of three. So anyway, another uh, neat thing to pick up with you, uh, head over to American Science and Surplus. Um, and then, um, Goat's milk soap. So, you know, hand washing is all the rage these days. And uh, last year, uh, we had a member of our uh, KCCM class who makes goat's milk soap. And I've been using mine. I, I use it not only to wash my hands, um, but I've been using it on my hair as well. It does a, a really nice job, keeps my hair soft, and I'm not buying soap uh, shampoo in a plastic bottle when I use this soap. Um, I do add a little bit of uh, conditioner uh, after I use the soap on my hair, but um, I'm cutting my, my plastic bottle usage in half by doing that. Uh, another great thing about bar soap like this is it's um, not in a uh, plastic bottle the way a uh, pump bottle of soap might be. Um, and then 
Nancy uh, makes, um, let's see, she's got, right now she's got peppermint, she's got um, honey oatmeal, she's got lavender, uh, she's got several different varieties of soap. If you're interested in buying some goat's milk soap, she's selling them for $5 a bar, and um, I'd be glad to tell you, shoot me an email, um, let me know. She's uh, actually traveling right now, um, but we'll be back before Christmas. I think she's getting home on the 20th. Um, I know I'll be putting an order in uh, when she gets back, and I can certainly um, facilitate you guys getting some too, if you're interested in locally produced goat's milk soap. So very cool gift idea, um, and very timely too, because uh, uh, you gotta keep those hands clean. Um, so nature in a jar, this was something that I did um, as kind of a joke column several years ago. And I was digging around here um, in a couple boxes here at Good Natured World Headquarters and I found I still had it. And you know what? It is still, um, you know, I would say gift worthy. This is a picture of it. Um, for those of you who like uh, handmade or homemade gifts, this is um, a bit of nature. And in this case, it's the, uh, the cast, the exoskeleton of a um, cicada. And it's suspended in another timely substance, hand sanitizer. Now, when I first did this, this was in, I think, 2015. Uh, hand sanitizer was really easy to find. Um, I don't know if you you know, want to choose to, to waste your hand sanitizer this year on making homemade gifts. But, you know, it could be that the hand sanitizer is still viable. Um, and you can just give, give that as a gift, but stick a bug in there and um, you know, thrill those of uh, lucky folks on your, your gift giving list. You know, I'm actually going to stop the share um, because I have the jar right here and I'll show you what it looks like. So um, you can, you know what, this jar came from Science and Surplus too. Over the years, um, some air has gotten in. Uh, as I recall, when you, when you make this to start with, um, you uh, put the, the object that you want to suspend, and it doesn't have to be a, a bug. It could be, you know, some acorns or something else you found that's um, kind of pretty or interesting. Um, and you, pump the hand sanitizer in, and then you kind of knock it to get the bubbles to rise. And when those bubbles disappear, then you add some more, and you get it, uh, you get it to, it's filled all the way up to the top. Now, as I said, I didn't have this screwed. I didn't think I'd ever use it again <laughs> five years ago. I thought it was just a gift for me. But um, you can um, uh, suspend cool nature items in hand sanitizer. Uh, actually, looking at this, it looks like I put uh, an annual cicada in a periodical cicada shell in the gel. So anyway, handmade gifts for those of you who are so inclined. Um, now I've got uh, also prompted by a, um, a reader email. Uh, a gentleman wanted to give a, a friend of his uh, a field guide. And, and he was actually looking at a, kind of a combo pack of field guides um, by a gentleman named Stan, uh, Stan Tequila. Um, tequila spelled differently. Um, but this is, he was looking at birds of Wisconsin because he and his buddy go canoeing in Wisconsin all the time. This is birds of Illinois. And if you're looking to give um, a field guide for someone who is just a you know, kind of a casual birder, maybe looks out the window and wants to know what's at the bird feeder. This is a nice book. Um, it's arranged a little differently than some of the more uh, in-depth um, uh, field guides. It's by color. Um, I'm going to see if I can hold this up. See these tabs here on the corner of the page? Um, maybe if I hold it this. Um, so here we're in the gray bird section. Um, here's the green birds, um, which there's not very many, there's the male mallard. Um, here is the orange section, American red start. Um, so it's, it's easy to flip through if somebody says, oh gosh, you know what, I just saw a red bird 
Um, well, in Illinois, we've got um, a few red birds, the main one being the cardinal, but we've also got scarlet tanagers that move through here in um, the spring and the fall. Um, and uh, the other thing, now some people like this and some people don't. This field guide uses photographs. Um, one thing that's nice about photographs is that you, you see an actual bird represented in the picture. Um, the bad thing about photographs is that you're seeing an individual of a species. Um, if you want to get an idea of, of the variation um, within a species, this uh, uh, field guide with actual photographs isn't going to help a lot. Um, they, they will explain in the text what the variations can be, but um, you've really just got that one photograph uh, to look at. If you want something um, a little bit more uh, in depth, uh, there's the Peterson guides, which were the long standing favorites. Uh, Peterson guides have drawings uh, and they have the nice benefit of arrows in the drawings that point out the key field marks. Uh, so the Peterson guide to birds, um, that's the, been the standard for decades. Um, but I gotta tell you, my, my favorite is actually the Sibley guide. Um, now some people will say Sibley gives you too much information. Um, if we look at a page, um, oh, let's see, let me pick out, um, oh, well, let's see, here's the bald eagle. You know, bald eagles have a lot of variation depending on age, um, and this gives you uh, David Sibley's artistic renderings of the bald eagle at every stage of its development, years one through, uh, either four or five, as it uh, matures. Um, the other nice thing, now, so um, Tequila's books are by state. So this was Birds of Illinois. If, it's, uh, if you're in Illinois, and you only care about birds in Illinois, you can, you can go with this book and, and just be done with it. Um, the Sibley Guide, um, there's a, a large, almost like coffee table size book that is the, um, Birds of North America. Um, after that book came out, then they split it up into two books that are, um, if you've got big pockets or you take a, a small backpack with you when you head out, um, this is a great book to, to, uh, to carry along. It's, it's much smaller. I would say it's about eight inches or maybe five inches. Um, <clears throat> besides having the information about the species, uh, it also has a range map on the page, so you don't have to flip back and forth. Uh, that was a thing with Peterson uh, for a long time. You, you, well, you, you look up the, the bird on one page, but then you have to go to another page to look up what the, um, the range of the species is. So um, this is, like I said, it's my, my current favorite, but it is a lot of information. Some would say too much information, uh, but certainly worthy if uh, you or someone you love is uh, into birds. Now, um, I brought a couple of books that are no longer in print, but I wanted to mention them. And I, I apologize um, for these, using the camera on my laptop, all this text is going to appear backwards. But this book um, is called um, The Birder's Handbook. It's not a field guide. Look at it. This thing is, is gosh, it's almost uh, two and a half inches thick. Um, not something you'd want to lug around with you, but it's kind of a, it's a great companion to what you find in the field. Um, each uh, species in North America is profiled here um, in a very concise form. Um, there's a lot of, um, let me hold this up, see there's, there's a lot of uh, little icons that uh, let you know whether it nests in a tree or in the ground. Uh, what the nest is made of, how many eggs it lays, how long it takes those eggs to hatch, what the hatchlings are fed. Um, and there's, there's also neat species notes as well. Great book uh, if you want to uh, look for the story behind the story. Once you've got your bird identified, if you want to know more about it, this is a fabulous book. It's out of print, um, but 
you can find it pretty easily in used bookstores. I know I was, I was in a used bookstore um, a couple of years ago. There were six copies of the Birder's Handbook in the, the nature section. So um, uh, it's uh, Paul Ehrlich, David Dabkin, and Daryl Way are the uh, authors of it. Um, but it's a great companion to the field guide, um, a field guide person in your life. Um, and then finally, this is another book, and I was bummed to realize that it's now out of print, but um, it's helped me figure out um, a lot of uh, bird species that can be difficult to decipher. Um, this is a kind of an offshoot um, of the, uh, the magazine, Bird Watchers Digest. It's a, uh, it's a cool book called Identify Yourself. And uh, it is available. I checked um, Amazon has some used copies, Abe Books. Um, there's a third used book. Uh, oh, eBay has it. Um, it's about 15 bucks used. Um, they all seem to be in pretty good condition. But um, if you're struggling with, um, like, say, Cooper's Hawk and Sharp Shin Hawk, there's a whole chapter on trying to sort out those details. Um, there's a... Uh, a section on the drab swallows, um, bank and rough wing swallows, sorting out the, um, uh, the ID characteristics of those. Uh, the medium-sized probing shorebirds. <laughs> um, like I said, it's, it's just, it's a handy thing. I've, I've used this a lot when I've been on vacation and uh, traveling in areas where I'm not, you know, I'm seeing things that you don't usually see around here. Um, and it's well well written too. It's it's easy to read, and there's some uh, there's some great illustrations in here as well to help you sort out what you're seeing in the field. So um, that's for the uh, the uh, birders in your life. If you're looking for some books, uh, I've got one more thing. Um, this was something, and I, I forget why. I got on an animal stories kick, but those of you who've lived in the Chicago area for the last several decades, you might remember Uncle Lair and Little Tommy. Um, WLS, uh, I remember when I, uh, gosh, I was in, working my first job in, in high school in the animal stories mobile unit. Remember they had that van that they would drive around in and they'd hand stuff out. Um, it was uh, parked at the shopping center that was about a half mile from where I was working at. So I, um, punched out at 11.30 and I took an extra long lunch so I could go stand in line and get my uh, animal stories uh, with Uncle Lair and Little Tommy t-shirt. By the time I got to the front of the line, they only had extra small. <laughs> so I never actually got to wear it, but uh, I did get the t-shirt and I bet it's somewhere in a drawer at my mom's house to this day. Anyway, the reason I'm mentioning animal stories is that um, they did, um, Lair Lujak and uh, Tommy Edwards did uh, a couple of I think there's three total recordings of animal stories, LPs. Uh, they did these to benefit some charities in Chicago. Uh, and these, there's a surprising number of copies of these available on um, eBay. Um, I just got uh, my dad's old turntable from my mom's house. I, uh, my hope was to get it set up so I could play one of these for you tonight, but um, that didn't happen. But if, uh, if you have fond memories of animal stories with Uncle Lair and little Tommy, little snot-nosed Tommy, um, or if you know someone who does, I think these would make um, fabulous gifts and they're, I don't know, they're less than, than uh, 10 bucks each. So um, vinyl's coming back and uh, what better way to welcome it than with a copy of Animal Stories. All right, with that, i um, got one more thing uh, and it's seasonally appropriate. A um, little bit of nature nerd fashion here. Uh, this is my latest acquisition. I've uh, just been breaking it in. This is a Stormy Cromer hat. Uh, Stormy Cromer, legend has it, was um, a gentleman who lived up in the UP and he wore baseball caps. Uh, and the only problem with his baseball caps was that in the winter time, his ears would get cold. So he asked his wife to sew on a headband so that he could um, keep his ears warm. And from that, this design was born. Um, the Stormy Cromer, it's not an ear flap hat. These don't fold down. What you do is you pull this band down around your ears. 
keeps your ears warm, keeps your hat from blowing off, makes you look really cool um, in a in a nature nerdy kind of way. Um, and it's it's these are um, U.S. made. They're they're made up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. They come in lots of cool colors, um, and they're actually sized too. Um, it's not small, medium, large. You need to actually measure um, your hat size. Uh, and they come with a, a certificate of authenticity, something no uh, cold weather nature nerd should be without the Stormy Cromer hat. All right. Um, well, that's what I've got uh, for this evening. Um, I'm just going to make a quick check here of the um, uh, chats. Um, Chris has not seen any stink bugs. Um, and that's the thing, Chris, you said you didn't have noticed until now. That's the thing, a lot of times something, um, you know, if something's there, it's easier to notice than uh, if it's not there. You know, the absences sometimes uh, go unnoticed. Like when, um, when the juncos leave in the springtime, a lot of people don't notice that they're gone until they, you know, they suddenly realize our snowbirds have left us. Um, but okay, Chris doesn't have any. Uh, Silvana saw a live one today. I've seen about 10 so far. Uh, Laura only had one this fall. Um, Susie has had any, which is weird. Um, and now Silvana's not sure if she had um, the invader or the native. She's gonna take a closer look next time. That's what this is all about. Um, and um, Kay has noticed. Uh, the chipmunks, uh, she noted that chipmunks eat brown walnuts and harvest and stockpile them um, to fit in just about every nook and cranny of their storage room. Um, ah, and Bob, yeah, Bob Andrini made the important note about our uh, Sibley guides. The East, so the Sibley guide to birds of the East, um, Eastern United States, has red. Sibley Guide to Birds of the West is purple. So if you're getting this guide for someone who lives around here, make sure you get the uh, Eastern United States. Um, I think that's all I got for tonight. I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you. Does anybody have any questions uh, about what we talked about? Any uh, nature news you'd like to share? Well, we did have some of the sting bugs, but now I don't know which one it was. And we were feeding them to the praying mantis, who sadly passed away this past week. Oh. After two and a half months of captivity, Santiago has left us four cases of eggs and <laughs> happy memories. Well, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss, Silvana. Um, if, if you freeze the body, it'll dry out and, and make a nice... I, I, you know what? You could put it in hand sanitizer. If you still... We, <laughs> <laughs> we actually we actually put it in resin, so we have okay. stuff. So oh, we she'll last forever that way. Yeah. Um, well, and we'll talk later. I still owe you some cockroaches, um, even if you have nothing to feed them. To, and anybody else who needs uh, live insect food for anything you might be feeding, send me an email. I've got lots of dubia roaches that I need to find homes for. Pam, I wanted to do a, can you hear me? Yeah, hey Susie. It's, um, I wanted to do a commercial for Aldo Leopold's um, crane virtual viewing. I did this just before you tonight, uh -huh. and it was an excellent presentation on cranes themselves and how they migrate and all this stuff about them. And then it took you to their actual viewing place and showed the cranes coming in and the noises and all that stuff it was wonderful oh and i think i think they're doing this for the next at least the rest of this month if you go to the aldo leopold foundation okay and you can sign up there it's free it's virtual took about an hour and they talked about the restoration they've been doing and all sorts of stuff it was really very interesting Cool. And then, so that's um, up in uh, near Baraboo. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Susie. I'll check that out. You're welcome. Anybody else? 
Hey, Pam, this is yeah. Laura. I, w I was wondering, you were, since we we're talking about um, some invasive species and things like that, uh -huh. I was, I was, I just am getting to my October Smithsonian, and okay. I don't know if I'm behind the ball or what, but I'm reading about the lanternfly in oh, Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I haven't even finished the article yet, but amazing and so scary. Um, I didn't know if you had any more information about that. I mean, it's a really cool as it goes through its life cycle, but it seems to be stripping everything anywhere. And uh, just didn't know if you had any insight or more information on that. You know, I don't, other than, they're that crazy looking, um, they're, uh, aren't they a moth? Um, yeah, they call it the lanternfly, but it's moth, yeah. Yeah, and they've, they're, they're, they've got like a white, and spotted wings and then they, they've got red on them um yeah oh, this has got a picture of it there it is yeah there you go it's actually very beautiful looking um but uh from what i've read i'm about halfway through the article i mean it eats just about any tree um, now is it is it like the gypsy moth is that where it just produces like tons of of caterpillars is that um it, it, I'm, I'm not Sure, because I haven't gone through all of it, but what they're saying is as they they invade and swarm a tree, then they drop down a lot of um, sticky liquid that then kills the vegetation underneath it. Um, oh, the poopers. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, I mean, they're talking apple trees, peach trees, grape vines. Um, the vineyards are going mm -hmm. crazy. Um, Thank you, Chris. Huh. Yeah, I just... I was alarmed because I hadn't heard, you know, and looking at the pictures of the swarms, and it seems to be centered around Pennsylvania, but moving, I really hadn't heard anything about it and was <clears throat> shocked. Again, this was in October. Yeah, Smithsonian. Yeah, Smithsonian. So, so I'm behind. But uh, I, Laura, that's so yeah. funny that you mentioned that because um, today I was, this is Diane, I was okay. driving from, um, Milwaukee to, to Campton Hills, my home, mm -hmm. and um, there's a big billboard when you're driving south on 94, and I, and, I, and I just quickly looked at it. It's something like Beware the Green Lantern, and it had some pictures, and and I had never heard of it before either, and then you brought it up again tonight, so yeah. Uh, Hey, look, if you make that uh, that journey down from Milwaukee, you'll see. And now there may have been more on the other side of the road too. I don't know, yeah. but I yeah. definitely saw a, a huge billboard and uh, that had you know about the Green Lantern fly. Yeah, and it's it's it shocking what it it seems to be able to do and um, could put a lot of people out of business. Um, and let alone, I mean, you know, in your yards, I mean, it can get a silver maple, it can get anything, um, let alone people who have orchards or vineyards or nurseries or things like that. So I, I was, it's a, it's a really cool looking insect as it goes through its life stages. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I totally, kind of scary type, one of those scary invasions. So, um... I just did a quick check here on um, uh, the Illinois Department of Agriculture, and it says that it has not yet been spotted in Illinois, but if you suspect you've seen one, um, they ask you to call. Uh, they've got a number here, 815-787-5476, um, or you can take a photo and uh, send the description of where you found it at to lanternfly at illinois.edu. Um, but yeah, sounds like this sounds like the sort of thing that might spread the same way uh, gypsy moths and things do if you move, um, you know, if you're moving. And that's that's the thing, you know, you know, I don't know how many times I've, you know, traveled places and I've picked up objects, you know, pine cones or whatever and brought them home and I just now I, I kind of shudder to think you know what have I you know did I accidentally bring something home with me um I did one time uh get pulled over um pulled out of line in the airport um I was coming back from San Diego and the uh the security guys 
or like uh, open your bag. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I pull out and I, I had actually um, uh, a couple of field guides in there. And I, all I could think of was, oh, they saw me pick up those, they, they know I have Tory pine needles. Tory pine, um, the needles are kind of like a trough like this. Um, they, um, uh, they angle upward and when the, uh, the, sea, the uh, moisture from the, the sea spray, um, where they grow along the coast and, and the dew, when that collects on the needles, it rolls down that trough on the top of the needle and it waters itself. Um, you know, it can grow in, in dry areas because of its way of collecting water from the moist air. Well, anyway, I'm thinking, oh no, you know, the, the uh, APHIS guys, the Department of Ag guys are gonna nail me for, you know, transporting agricultural, you know, materials. Well, turns out they had seen my um, colored pencils. I was doing some drawing at the time. They thought I had darts that I was gonna, I don't know, throw around the airplane cabin or something and <laughs> weapons in my, bag that turned out to be colored pencils. They didn't care about the Tory pine needles and I told them they probably should. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, uh, that's a good thing to know about and uh, something good to be aware of um, as we get into next year and in more warm weather. Maybe we'll be moving around more by that point. We'll be driving more. Just got to be aware of what we're transporting. Anybody else? Well, if not, um, happy Tuesday, everybody. Really appreciate you taking the time to, to hang out with us this evening. Um, next week, we are going to tackle, um, we're going to take one crack. Which it's actually going to be a two-part story, but we're going to take a crack at a mystery that occurred down at the Wildflower Sanctuary in Batavia. Um, mysterious happenings that were going on down there. Uh, got a couple uh, emails. I didn't get to this evening that we'll get to next week. And of course, you never know what kind of late breaking nature news we'll have uh, as time goes on this coming where, week. Where is the Wildflower Sanctuary in Batavia? Uh, Wildflower Sanctuary is on the, um, the river walk in Batavia. So you go to downtown Batavia, you park, you know where the, the uh, city hall is and the um, police station? There's a parking lot north of the police station. If you park there and you walk, uh, River Rain Apartments are out on that peninsula. And there's a, there's a nice paved walkway that goes all the way around. That's the Wildflower Sanctuary, uh, maintained by um, uh, stewards, uh, volunteer stewards led by Sarah Kimber and the Plain Dirt Gardeners. Yeah, check it out, Chris, you'd like it. Hey, Pam. Yes, I've, been, I've been there. It's oh, really okay. cool. And it it's is pretty, cool. it has all these steps and different. Yeah, levels. yeah, right there on the river. Yep. Yucky. How long are you going to continue these classes, which are great? Um, you know what? They said that to, um, I think we've re-upped them now through January. Um, yeah, the last time I checked, they just had next week, so I wasn't <laughs> sure. Well, you know what, I'll double check because <laughs> I'm in charge of entering them and I may have screwed something up, but I thought I continued it through, I want to say through January or mid-February, but I'll double check because they, they said they just keep going. So if you guys will keep great. showing up, I'll keep showing up. That's wonderful. Keep hanging out. Yeah, right. thank you. Great. All right. All right, everybody. Good night, Pam. Stay Bye. well. Nice to see you. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> <laughs>